Acts chapter 8 in your Bibles, and Lord willing, we'll be finishing the chapter this evening. Uh, we uh, began this chapter with persecution, and so they were scattered, uh, the Christians uh, among Jerusalem. And uh, Saul was making havoc of the church. Philip, in verse 5, goes to Samaria. They start uh, just Trust in Christ, the people in Samaria. Last week, uh, we, we, we saw, as we began in, in verse number 9, uh, last week we looked at how the gospel came to the Samaritan. Uh, Satan had a hold on an individual, Simon the sorcerer, remember that? And then he had a hold on the whole city. And yet, the power of the gospel changed their lives. And they believed. And then Simon thought, oh man, I want to believe too. And he believes and, and is baptized that they show their, their belief and their, their trust in Christ and identification with him. And then Peter and John come, uh, uh, representatives of the church of Jerusalem, laid hands on them. Uh, uh, the, the apostolic authority that they had to recognize, yes, this is a church. Yes, these people have say, are saved. Receive the Holy Ghost. And Simon said, I want that too. I want that power. Here's some money. Can I buy it? And uh, they, they rebuked him for that. And so a great revival really is happening in this city, in this area of Samaria. We finish with verse 25 of Acts 8. And just by way of review, if you look at it, it says, And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem. This is Peter and John. And it says, And they preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. We took some time at the end of the service last week to look at Peter and John that had gone through that area. And John specifically, when he was with Jesus, saying, Rain down fire from heaven, destroy them all. They don't deserve it. They'll never hear it. We, we're going past this. Nothing good can come out of here. And so we saw, we concluded with the thought that not only was the gospel changing lives of those who were unsaved to come to Christ, but the gospel was changing lives of those who had been saved and still was having an effect on their life. And, and they, were, they were seeing the value of people. The gospel has that power. As the persecution became more intense on the church, they began to scatter out. Philip, we've already seen, had gone to Samaria. And the Lord began to bless his ministry. As I mentioned this morning, things are going well for him. Things are going well for those people. And then we get to verse 26. The Bible says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go. I'll be honest with you, I don't get it. What? Why does he need to arise and go? Things are going so well. People are being saved. But the angel of the Lord said, arise and go. Arise and go toward the south, under the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Not only does he need to get up and go, he needs to go to the desert. <laughs> Now, as I was reading through this, I was thinking, oftentimes we get desert and dessert mixed up. If I was called to the dessert, yeah, here my Lord, send me, right? But this is not the dessert. This is the desert. And he arose and went. And before we get into the rest of these verses, as we go through the rest of the chapter, let's pray. Ask the Lord to speak to our heart and we'll break these verses down and see how it applies to us as well. Lord, we thank you for the time we've already had in, in your house, amongst your people, singing your praise, giving uh, you uh, praise, a testimony of your goodness. Would you speak to our hearts? Would you open our eyes to behold wondrous things out of thy law? Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Really, the whole thought this evening is what we just mentioned, called to the desert. Call to the desert. Why? Truth of the matter is, we may never understand why. And it's not, I don't believe it's wrong for us to ask God why at times. What is wrong, though, is when we require an answer from God. As, as flesh, as human beings, it's, it's a natural, perhaps, instinct to ask why, but it's wrong to demand an answer of an almighty God. He's already told us that his ways are higher than our ways. Yep. That his thoughts are not our thoughts. And so he, he has a, a plan and a purpose. And we see, first of all, the call of Philip. The call of Philip. God calls a man. 
the angel who directed Philip could have told the story that we're going to see to the one who uh, he goes to. In fact, let me just read a few verses. Verse 27, and he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet, then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? So here we have a call of Philip. God's calling a man, watch this, to go to another man. Now in my mind, I'm thinking the angel of the Lord that called Philip could have just gone and talked to the Ethiopian eunuch himself. Let Philip, let him be there in Samaria, but that's not what happened. God hasn't, in fact, he's never given angels the task to go and give the gospel. Yep. That's, right. that's a task that he has called us to, right. to go and tell someone else. Oftentimes I've thought, God, why don't you just write this in the sky and the whole world will believe, but that's not his plan. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is when we think about it and the more we think about it, I'm blown away that an almighty God would say, I want to use you. What an honor. Yeah. What a privilege to have a message from the creator of the universe to tell others. The savior of the world wants us to tell those who don't know him all about him. Mm -hmm. An angel of the Lord directs Philip here. God calls a man. And oftentimes you can, uh, not oftentimes, mark it down every time. The calling of God on our lives is always for us to follow him, to follow his son. What does that mean? When we follow Jesus, following Jesus means that we're going to be more like him. When you follow someone, you become like them. A true follower becomes like their leader. Uh, if you're in, in any kind of company and, uh, and, and you have a, a boss, and oftentimes if you're uh, wanting that position, you start to learn how, how they think and, 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 and how they, they function, and, and you become a little bit like them. That's not a bad thing. Spiritually speaking, as Christians, that word Christian actually means a little Christ. Romans 8, 29 says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. We are called to be like Jesus. And as Jesus calls us, he's calling us to be like him, to follow him, to be concerned with loving people. Describe Jesus in the Gospels. Describe Jesus' life and ministry. And here's what you're going to find. You're going to find him loving people. You're going to find him, watch this, meeting people's needs. You're going to find him telling of himself and of God. Concern for winning souls. Concern for loving people. Concern for meeting their needs. And as God calls us, as he already has, to be more like him. And we understand the call of Philip. God called a man, but then God called a man to the desert. Why would he call a man to the desert? Again, I can't understand. I can't speak for God. I'm just surmising. But... When something special happens in the desert, God's going to get the glory for that. When something special happens that, that makes no sense any other way, it's as if God's saying, glorify me. It's not about you. I want to use you, but the praise and glory goes to me. Uh, there's a famous uh, picture, photo of a flower oftentimes uh, growing atop a cactus from some rocks. And, and the phrase that you may have seen many times underneath it is bloom where you're planted. Where are you? Where has God called you? Do something for him there. But it doesn't make sense. It's not easy. And this doesn't all work. And there's not many people here or that don't see this or I, I'm not part of this call. None of that matters. Because we're called to be like him. And if he's called us. Uh, and, and he has called us. I keep saying if he's called us. He's called all Christians to be like him. Mm -hmm. 
and, and to do what he asks. Gaza here, the city where they're uh, going, was one uh, city a few miles from the Mediterranean Sea. It was a very rough, very needy place. Uh, historians tell us there were really only two main roads from Jerusalem down to Gaza. And one of them was very, very, uh, was not very much traveled by, which happens to be the road that he's on and the direction that he's going. Uh, one missionary society was writing to David Livingston, the, the famous missionary in Africa. And they asked, have you found a good road to where you are? If so, we want to know how to send other men to join you. Livingston replied, if you have men who will come only if they know there's a good road, I don't want them. I want men who will come if there's no road at all. What you saying? It's not about the pathway being convenient. It's about if we're going to follow God. We're going to do what he said regardless of the circumstances that come. You say, well, why? It may be difficult. Well, in that way, in that manner, we won't be receiving the praise. We won't be receiving the glory. We'll see how much God can do in an impossible situation. We see God calls the man. God calls the man to the desert. But what I also see in this passage that boggles my mind is Philip obeys. Put yourself in his shoes for a moment. You've already left Jerusalem. You've gone to Samaria, a new place that was under satanic hold. You preach the gospel, the whole city gets saved, the ringleader of the demonic worshipers gets saved as well. Uh, Peter and John, the, the main guys from the church come and uh, give authority there to your church. Things are going great. Now you gotta go. Arise and go. In verse 27, then he arose and went. Simple obedience. Yet it's not that simple, is it? Lord, you said this, but Lord, you're doing this in my life, and but Lord, I, I believe you're leading me this way, but Philip could have had a list. He arose and went. He arose and, uh, and went, verse 27, behold, a man of Ethiopia. So not only did he, he leave Samaria, but he's going to be called to do something else. We have here a man of Ethiopia. It says a unit of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning, sitting in his chariot, right as they asked the prophet. We're going to go through this Ethiopian man in just a moment. But notice the calling again. Then the spirit, first it was the angel. Now there's the Holy Spirit living inside him saying what? Said unto Philip, go near, join thyself to this chariot. Okay, let's jump on the story here. He's, uh, 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 he arose, he went. Now, if you can imagine this man, as it said, he's uh, a man of great authority under the queen in charge of the treasury. Uh, somebody like that doesn't travel alone, Okay. He's undoubtedly got dozens of people with him, perhaps many chariots. The spirit says, hey, Philip, yeah, that guy in charge, yeah, go right up to him. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm like, I don't know about this. Let me just uh, send him a note. <laughs> Let me uh, go talk to the, his, his servant here in the back. What does he do? Notice verse 29, the spirit said unto Philip, go near, join yourself to this chariot. Watch this, verse 30. And Philip ran. <laughs> He ran. I don't see it. Perhaps he's thinking it, but I don't see any of it written. And Philip thought, I wonder if this is a good idea. I wonder if they're going to jump me just as soon as I do. Running to the man in charge, right to his chariot. He runs. That's the way we should obey. Watch this. If we get nothing else this evening, when God speaks, we must obey. Trust yeah. and obey. All of our thoughts, all of our reasoning of why it doesn't make sense or why there's a problem, drop all that. Arise and go. Run thither. He ran to the chariot. Oftentimes, we live in a society, and if we're not careful, we take the path of least resistance. 
But Philip here has a spirit of faith and obedience. God calls a man. I want us to transition a little bit away from Philip and turn towards this Ethiopian eunuch as we see second of all, not only the call of a man and call of God, but the concern of God. God's concern, first of all, is for the lost. God's concern is for the lost. Do you understand what's happening? Again, I, I hate to be uh, redundant, but a whole city is trusting Christ and living for Christ. And God takes the leader of it, Philip, and says, I've got an appointment for one individual for you to make. Why? Because God has concern for the lost. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Philip could have been intimidated. Uh, we go back to him, the Ethiopian's entourage. Undoubtedly, he's traveling with dozens of people. Let's look a little bit about his life. A man of Ethiopia, it says, a eunuch of great authority. Again, he's high up under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This is a, a line of, of uh, people that goes all the way back really to Solomon's day. In Solomon's day, if you recall, the queen of Sheba came to see the greatness of his kingdom and was blown away by it. And, and, and said, well, really, the half was not told me. It's where we find that passage. This is the same line of people. That word Candace is oftentimes uh, given to a, a, a royal, a, a, it was the royal family name. Uh, oftentimes, like you'll hear, you know, King Henry, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eight, so on and so forth. That's what this is referring to. And the, it says Queen of the Ethiopians, Ethiopia, a country in Africa, but at this time it was a much bigger uh, area, much bigger region. And what, what has he done? Who had the charge of all her treasure, into verse 27, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. So this Ethiopian man, high up in authority, was a Jew. And he had come to Jerusalem for to worship. He had come for some feast. He had come to worship God. This is his heart. Verse 28 was returning and sitting in his chariot. Read Isaiah the prophet. This guy has a desire to find God. In fact, he had just gone to Jerusalem and he's on his way back. And it's as if he didn't get what he was looking for. He's searching for something. God is concerned for the lost and God's plan to save the lost. Uh, we'll, we'll look at it in just a moment. But what I see with this man is his success didn't satisfy. You catch it? Do you catch the whole description of him? How high up he had gone on the ladder and he still wasn't happy. World success will never satisfy. It won't do it. You're looking for something to fill the longing in your heart. Watch this. It doesn't matter how high up that corporate ladder you get. You're not going to find it there. There's satisfaction only uh, in Jesus. But God's plan here to save the lost is carried out by the faithfulness of his children to share the gospel. He's given you and I the greatest mission mm -hmm. of all time. Watch this. And if we fail to deliver that message... There is no other plan. Guess that there's no plan B for God to get the gospel out. He uses us. Mm -hmm. Some people these days will say, well, if God wants them to be saved, and if I don't show it, somebody else will. Oh, that's the wrong attitude to have. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. We're supposed to be like Christ, and God has a concern for the lost. God's concern is also for the seeker. The Ethiopian was reading in uh, verse uh, 28. He read Isaiah, Isaiah, which is Isaiah the prophet. Philip goes to him in verse 30 and ran thither to him, heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? So Philip is running to this chariot and it was custom in that culture when you read to read out loud. As he's coming closer, he hears... Hey, this man's reading the Bible. 
This man's reading some Old Testament. He, he's, he's paid some money for this scroll. He's reading. He's really searching. Mm -hmm. We'll see if he understands what he's reading. Notice what he says in verse 31. He said, how can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. I mean, incredible. I'm reading this. You understand what you're reading? It's so, I don't get it. It's not computing. I need someone to help me. God had a concern for the seeker. The eunuch here, the Ethiopian eunuch was a Jew, was a Jew seeking to worship God, but he hadn't found Jesus. His trip to Jerusalem left him searching for answers. Watch this, but God's faithful to send those who are searching for the truth an opportunity to receive it. We're going to go through these last several verses pretty quickly here, but I want us to look back again at verse number 29. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that it says, then the spirit said unto Philip. You know, we had a whole series of messages in March of last year, April, May, of how to listen to God, how to hear his voice. Some people will say, how do I know, Pastor, if this is the Holy Spirit speaking to me? I really believe there are three main uh, determining factors if we know if something's from, from God's Spirit speaking to us. First of all, it will agree with the Bible. Someone who says, God told me to, to leave my wife and go over here. No, 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 hold on, hold on. That wasn't the Holy Spirit. That's not His Word. His Spirit will speak in agreements agreements with his word. Second of all, oftentimes when the spirit speaks, it will magnify Jesus. Well, the spirit told me this, and that Jesus isn't the son of God, but this other one is. No, 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 not the Holy Spirit. It will agree with his word. It will magnify Jesus. But I want us to catch this. Oftentimes what the spirit says centers on evangelism. Catch that? The spirit speaks often for us to tell someone else about Jesus. Mark it down. Oftentimes as the Spirit speaks to people throughout the New Testament, it was the problem. Go share it here. Go over here. Remember Acts 1.8? Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. What's that for? Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and in the uttermost parts of the world. We're supposed to go. That's why the Holy Spirit's there. So when he speaks, oftentimes it's to go tell someone about Jesus, but what is wonderful to think about is that when God leads, he's already prepared. When God leads me to go speak to him, God has already prepared him. Oftentimes, we just need to be bold and obey. We live in a, a society that, that wants to push back on the, the love of Christ and the gospel of Christ and the blood of Christ. And yet that same society is very bold in pushing their message. This world is very bold in pushing its message of sin and acceptance and tolerance. And yet we as Christians at times cower back. When God said, hold on, I've already prepared hearts. I've given you my spirit. Have the boldness to follow through. Why? God's concern is for the lost. God's concern is for the seeker. We see the call of God. We see the concern of God. I want us to end in these last 10 verses looking at the conversion of the Ethiopian. Verse 31, and he said, how can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip. He'd come up and sit with him. So now Philip gets up in the chariot and watch what happens. Verse 32, the place of the scripture, which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb, dumb before his shears, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? It's amazing to me that this man, of all things, was reading scripture. And of all the Old Testament he could have been reading, he's reading from Isaiah. And from the whole 66 books of Isaiah, he's reading Isaiah 53. Let's go back and look at what Isaiah 53 says. Hold your spot there and turn back to Isaiah 53. 
Isaiah 53 is perhaps the most clear presentation of the gospel in all the Old Testament. Don't tell me that was just a happenstance. <laughs> the Ethiopian eunuch is reading. He's reading out loud. Philip hears it. Can I help you? Yes, I don't understand this. Here's what I'm reading. What does this mean? Basically, Philip, what must I do to be saved? He's ready. What does Isaiah 53 say? Verse 2, who he shall grow up before him. And let's go down to verse 3. He's despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. We hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised. We esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him with his stripes. We are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We turned everyone to his own way. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is a passage of scripture that the Ethiopian eunuch is having a hard time understanding. You see, Jews did not understand who the Messiah was. It didn't, they couldn't fathom in their mind that the Messiah would suffer. It didn't make sense to them that uh, the, the one who's going to come and rule and reign and set up his kingdom, he's going to suffer. He's going to die. They didn't accept it. That's why when Jesus came, they didn't think it could be him because he suffered. He died. And so this Ethiopian eunuch had gone to Jerusalem, wanted to seek after God, wanted, wanted, to, follow, wanted to understand all of this. It's not computing. He says, would you... Is, is this prophet, he says in verse uh, 34, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? When he's saying, Isaiah is writing this. Is Isaiah talking about himself? Who's he talking about? In verse 35, one of my favorite verses. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Mm-hmm. We have here the blueprint for us today. Watch this. As children of God, here's our blueprint. Number one, open our mouth. Number two, open the scripture. Number three, preach Jesus. That's all Philip did. Philip didn't sit back, let me give you time to think on this for a while and I'll be here if you have any other questions. No, he opened his mouth, he was bold. We've got to go tell. Others are searching and wanting. But he didn't open his mouth and give him his own philosophy. He opened his mouth, it says, and began at the same scripture. This is what changed his lives. Right here. You and I must open our mouth and share this. And it says he preached unto him his philosophy. No. He preached unto him Jesus. So let me, let me show you the Messiah. Let me show you what this passage is talking about. And undoubtedly, he started there in that passage and made his way to Jesus. And that's what the Bible does. Look here. In every passage, there's a trail from what you're reading right to Jesus. And we've got to see Christ. He's reading about Christ. He hears about Christ. Philip explains to him that Jesus was the fulfillment of this prophecy. It's a clear presentation of Jesus as Messiah. And it's so clear that oftentimes Jews won't even read that passage, even today. Wow. This eunuch, he desired to know God, but he couldn't be saved. Oh my, catch this. He desired to know God. He had gone to worship God, but he wasn't saved until he realized who Jesus was. The only true way to heaven. So many people will say, well, I'm seeking after God and I'm doing this. But if you don't believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God and the savior of the world, we're not saved. Oftentimes, too, we see the gospel and we, sal we see salvation as, as heaven, which is wonderful. But the gospel is so much more than just heaven. The gospel is Jesus. The gospel is me recognizing I can't do this on my own. The gospel is me seeing that Jesus has done it for me. I'm going to put my faith in him. That's what Philip is sharing with this Ethiopian unit. He hears about Christ. And then he receives Christ. Verse 36, and as they went on their way, they came into a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? 
So he says, hey, I'm ready to get baptized. I hear you. Now, I'm going to take a little side note for just a moment. But in uh, just about every other version of Scripture, Acts 8, 37 is not found. It goes from Acts 8, 36 to Acts 8, 38. See, here's water. What did tender me to be baptized? Verse 38. And he commanded the chair extend still, and they went down both into the water. But there's something that hinders him from being baptized first. What is it? Verse 37. Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. What is a prerequisite for baptism? Belief in Jesus. Salvation must happen before baptism. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We may look at that and say, that's it. Is that salvation for him? Put yourself in his shoes again. He's been searching for God. Hasn't found an answer. Finally sees the, 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 the scripture preached to him and, and showing how Jesus is the Messiah. And now he's saying, yes, I see it. I believe now Jesus is the Jesus Christ is the son of God. At that point, Philip said, okay, yeah, you got it. Let's go ahead and get baptized. As we see baptism, it happened uh, after he believed. Notice what else we see about baptism in verse 38. He commanded the chair to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, what do we see about water and baptism here? Pretty hard to sprinkle going down in and coming back up out of. Pretty hard to pour. Baptism means fully immersed. So we see something about baptism. It is after belief. It is fully immersed. And here's something else we see about baptism. Everywhere in scripture. Watch this. It's immediate. Right after salvation. So many uh, have the idea that let me just let this all really settle in. Let me understand. Let me grow in this before I do. And, script, and I'm not saying I'm against people that will do that. But in scripture we see it was immediate. Immediate. I'm going to identify with Christ. He's identified with me. Let me find something. I'll be honest with you. Strange. But kind of cool. Verse 39. When they were coming out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. That the unit saw him no more. We have a magic trick basically happening. <laughs> Philip vanishes. Caught up, caught away Philip. That's the same word that we get the, 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 the word rapture. He's raptured. And it says, and he went on his way rejoicing, verse 40. But Philip was found at Azotus. And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. I don't understand the significance of this. I just think it's cool. <laughs> Philip is caught away. And then he's found miles and miles away at a different city, Azotus. And as he makes his way uh, towards Caesarea, which was a major hub, he's preaching in all the cities. And he gets to Caesarea. We'll just give you a few closing thoughts this evening. Notice what the Ethiopian eunuch, what he sees in verse 39. That the eunuch saw him no more. I love this last phrase. And he went on his way rejoicing. You got an Ethiopian eunuch. I just saw the time. How about that? We're having a time tonight. I'm almost done. A little bit longer than normal, but that's all right. The Ethiopian eunuch, he's searching for God. He didn't find him in Jerusalem. He's on his way home. He's reading the scripture. I don't understand. All of a sudden, there's a preacher here. Yeah, come and show me. Oh, I believe that's Jesus. Yes, let's get baptized too. He gets baptized and boom, the preacher's gone. But the Ethiopian eunuch goes on his way rejoicing. He's not searching anymore. By the way, he's not rejoicing in Philip. Because Philip's gone and he's still rejoicing. He's rejoicing in Jesus. He's found something. More than that, he's found someone. And I believe when Jesus makes a difference in our lives, we'll tell others about him. Oh, yeah. We won't be able to help but tell what he's done. Mm -hmm. But as, as we close, in these 14, 15 verses that we've looked at, God works in Philip's life four different ways. First, an angel of the Lord speaks to him. 
I'm sorry, that wasn't first. First, uncontrollable circumstances at the beginning of the chapter makes him leave Jerusalem. Sometimes there are going to be things in life that we have no control over. God's going to move. Second, an angel of the Lord speaks to him. Third, the spirit of the Lord speaks to him. And fourth, he's raptured away. I believe we've all perhaps been in a place where uncontrollable circumstances move us and we find ourselves where we are. I believe all of us who are a child of God one day will be raptured away. But it's those middle two. The angel of the Lord saying, get up and go to a place that doesn't make sense. The spirit of the Lord saying, go talk to this one. Those are the hardest ones to follow, aren't they? Hardest ones to trust and obey. Philip here was called to the desert. We see the concern of God for an individual. And then we see the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. But I can't get over Philip's life. He's been in Samaria for a little time. He's called to an individual. He preaches to all these cities. The Bible says he goes to Caesarea. And we really don't hear much more about Philip until Acts 21. When Paul comes through Caesarea and sees Philip the evangelist. He's the only one that's called the evangelist. Philip settles down in Caesarea for at least 20 more years now. Finds a hub. God allows him to settle down and... and do a great work. It's there that Cornelius, who was one of the first Gentiles to be saved, his heart was completely open. Perhaps it's because of Philip's ministry. I don't know. But what we, what we do see in Philip's life is a willingness to answer God's call and to share his gospel. Folks, we've got to be willing to be bold to tell others of Jesus. I mentioned this morning that we'll be ordering this week a thousand door hangers for our city. We're going to take a step in this direction. You say, I don't know how to, how to tell someone about Jesus. We're going to, again, be working towards that. But we're going to take the first step. How about taking an invitation and putting it on someone's door? Not even saying anything. Let's go that direction. Pretty soon we'll be having specific times where we can go, or if those times don't work, other times that I'll go with you. Just giving out the gospel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an invitation to our church on the front. The whole back has a plan of salvation someone can take and read. Mm -hmm. We've had ones come to this church because they got an invitation. Had questions. People are searching. People look at And by the way, we're called to tell them. Not angels. Not acts of God. But us as Christians. Called to the desert. Sometimes I think Orland's a desert. <laughs> We've been called. Let's answer that call and go forward. Let's bow our heads and hearts together in prayer this evening. Thank you for listening.